Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the third session of the 31st Bar Media and Judiciary Conference for the second year presented with the organizational support of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation. I'm Ken Foskett with the foundation and along with Megan Hotchkiss, the, the co-organizer of this panel. For the full rundown of tomorrow's sessions and those that have already taken place, you can go to the agenda published on the Georgia First Amendment uh, website. That's gfaf.org. Gfaf we'll post a link along with a link to the bios in the chat feature of the Zoom interface. If you are a judge or attorney seek, seeking CLE credit, please be sure to identify yourself on the screen by the name you registered. Mom's computer or Jim's laptop as a screen identifier won't be good enough for tracking attendance. If you have questions for the panels, please post them in the chat. The panelists and moderators should be able to see them. The moderators will, will, will do their best to get to them as time permits. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, and mention the sponsors whose concert contributions go so far to support this conference. The names are now on the screen and I'll pause a moment to let you to, to let them soak in. I want to give particular shout outs to the State Bar of Georgia, CNN, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, the Daily Report and the Council of Superior Court Judges, the other judges councils and the Administrative Office of the Courts. This conference would not have been pulled together if it was not for the tireless work of volunteers whose names you see on the agenda. I wanna give a special thanks to Peter Canfield, a partner at Jones Day, who patiently guides this committee in the prep preparation of this event. Now we're ready to get started with today's panel, Communicating in the Disinformation Age. I'm a retired reporter and editor for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Panelists, if I could ask you to please turn on your cameras. All right. Following the 2016 election, in which grave concern arose over Russian efforts to sow dissension in the US presidential election, Technology platforms worked toward limiting the ability of foreign actors to interfere with American democracy. The 2020 election revealed that the threat to democracy came not just from without, but also from within. One of our panelists, Michael Baldessaro of the Carter Center, co-authored a report that showed the nature and reach of misinformation that sought to undermine confidence in America's democratic elections. The Big Lie and Big Tech reveals the breathtaking scope of these efforts and the degree to which major technology platforms waged largely weak and losing battles to contain them. Welcome, Michael Baldessaro. The misinformation assault on democracy comes at a time when traditional media reporting factual information at the local level has been in a death spiral. Another of our panelists today represents Georgia's besieged newspapers, several of which are suing Google and Facebook in a closely watched lawsuit that claims their advertising practices are putting traditional media out of business, strangling platforms that communicate legitimate news and information to readers. Mike Gephardt is president and CEO of Southern Community Newspapers and president of the Georgia Press Association. Welcome, Mike Gephardt. We'll also hear today from a member of the Georgia Court of Appeals who tweets, posts, and uses social media responsibly. Judge Sarah Doyle will offer her views on how the platforms can be used for good and sometimes for fun. You can find her at Judge Sarah Doyle. Welcome, Judge Doyle. All of our panelists have long and distinguished bios, and you can read more about them from the link that we'll post in the chat. All right, let's get started. We'll spend the first part of the discussion talking about some of the issues surrounding disinformation, and then get to a discussion about what to do about, about it. A reminder to our audience to please post your questions in the chat. 
All right, Michael Baldessaro, start us off and take a few minutes to highlight for uh, our listeners the findings of the big lie and big tech. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Ken, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Baldessaro. Uh, I'm a data scientist with the Carter Center. Uh, and leading our work globally to counter what we call digital threats, which is uh, online activity that can lead to real world harm. Now, I know this is a Georgia audience that is likely familiar with the Carter Center, but by way of background, just the Carter Center was established by former President Carter in 1982. And since that time, we've worked globally to monitor elections, identify potential harms that might undermine the will of the people, and you know, make recommendations for steps that can be taken to strengthen the process. Now, we primarily work overseas, but we turned our attention homeward in 2020 to address the harms posed by online misinformation to the integrity of our own elections here. And to that end, we published this report uh, called The Big Lie and Big Tech, which details exactly how election fraud narratives were spread on Facebook during the 2020 elections by media sources known to repeatedly publish misinformation. So we call them repeat offenders. And this report independently and incidentally corroborates the leaked documents that um, and the testimony that was given by the Facebook whistleblower to Congress in October of last year, specifically that Facebook knew that election fraud um, misinformation was being spread by repeat offenders and was being algorithmically amplified, yet they failed to intervene. Um, now, the report provides 16 recommendations for concrete actions that Facebook and other platforms can take right now to blunt the reach and, and impact of misinformation, and we'll get to that in the panel discussion, but um, move to the next slide, please. Um, but I'll, just to go into to the, the specific uh, findings of our report, um, I want to provide an overview of the report's main findings, but I want to briefly speak about the definitions and approach that we used. And so when we say repeat offenders, we're talking specifically about media outlets which have repeatedly published content that has been debunked by independent fact-checking organizations. And to identify who a repeat offender is, we relied on a database from a nonpartisan organization called NewsGuard, uh, which is led by a Yale professor um, and a, a former Wall Street Journal editor. Um, Excuse me for a minute. <clears throat> My throat is a little dry there. Um, so this is, sorry, NewsGuard is an organization that evaluates the credibility of media sources and, and tracks misinformation. And so to analyze the spread of repeat offender content, we collected more than 4.3 million posts from 883 Facebook groups between August 17th, which was the first day of the political party nominating conventions in 2020, uh, all the way through Inauguration Day. And we partitioned these Facebook groups into left and right leaning partisan echo chambers for analysis and applied some advanced data science techniques to identify uh, like-minded communities on social media platforms. Um, next slide, please. So when matching the links contained um, uh, in Facebook posts to NewsGuard database of repeat offenders, we found repeat offender content in 78% of all Facebook groups that we analyzed. However, the volume of content was exponentially greater in right-leaning groups. So across left-leaning groups, repeat offender content comprised about 0.34% of all links shared. Uh, by contrast, we found that 20% or one out of every five links shared in right-leaning groups was from a known misinformation repeat offender. So while repeat offender content was, was seemingly ubiquitous, the spread of repeat offender content was disproportionately right skewed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when we examined link sharing patterns across right-leaning groups, we found a significant amount of content from repeat offender sources that was referencing other repeat offender articles. So time and again, uh, one repeat offender source would fit individual data points or out of context information into a broader election frame narrative, and another source would cite that uh, media source for corroboration and amplify the content. And this pattern repeated itself throughout the election cycle and was tantamount to what we termed to be coordinated authentic behavior, since the content and behavior emanated from authentic domestic media sources as opposed to foreign actors and bot accounts. Next slide, please. Um, so while repeat offender content was found consistently on Facebook throughout the election cycle, we witnessed a dramatic 156% spike in the volume of repeat offender content between election day and January 6th. And now during that period, uh, the Stop the Steal movement was formed and reached its peak. And one out of every four links found in right-leaning Facebook groups originated from a repeat offender source. Next slide, please. 
Um, between election day and January 6th, 10 of the top 15 media sources that witnessed the highest spikes in content shares were repeat offenders. And so among the most popular sites during that time were Newsmax, which saw a 540% increase in link shares, uh, OAN, which saw a 330% increase, and Infowars, which saw a 210% increase in content shares. And by contrast, there was a 50% decrease in links being shared from Fox News during the post-election period compared to the pre-election period. Next slide, please. When we examine the headlines, which is often the only thing that social media users read, um, we found that election fraud was mentioned 3.8 times more in repeat offender headlines than in headlines from trustworthy or credible media sources. This number is especially significant when you consider the allegations of election fraud were covered by just about every news outlet during this period. When we drilled down into the headlines using sort of text mining techniques, we found that mentions of votes being switched or flipped were mentioned 54 times more often in repeat offender headlines. Next slide, please. When we applied some topic modeling techniques to these headlines, we found that um, the words that were most correlated with, with ballots were discarded, uh, shredded, and words that were most correlated with fraud were extensive, rampant, and systemic. This provides a pretty good perspective of the narrative topics with which social media users and right-leaning echo chambers were inundated with in the lead up to the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Next slide, please. And then we analyzed the 20 most frequently shared links in right-leaning groups. So the 20 most popular links during that time, we found that um, these 20 links alone were shared 283,000 times collectively with a reach of about 31.2 million Facebook users. Now, these 20 links are just the tip of the iceberg. In the two months between election day and inauguration day, we found more than 1,000 distinct repeat offender links reinforcing claims of election fraud. Next slide, please. Now, of the top 20 links to, related to election fraud, only four of them contain warning labels by Facebook to provide context that, you know, to users and signify that the content was, you know, downright to remove, reduce its virality. So um, this means that Facebook would have had, you know, fact-checking organizations review and label it, and then they would take appropriate action to, to um, reduce its, its visibility. And in multiple cases, we found one article was labeled as false and misleading, while a nearly identical article uh, from a different media source was not labeled, underscoring sort of this inadequate and inconsistent approach to content moderation being taken by Facebook. While you know articles that contain labels are downranked, um, articles that are that are that do not contain these labels are you know like any other article, they are algorithmically upranked. The more engagement they get, the more visibility uh, uh, that they receive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and ultimately, just a conclusion on this. I mean, the, the report concludes that, yes, there were there were myriad forces that coalesced to advance the big lie. Um, and But misinformation repeat offenders provided this critical connective tissue in the amplification of false election fraud narratives within social media echo chambers. And repeat offenders coordinated to reinforce the big lie. Uh, and they were doing it faster uh, than the speed of fact checking or faster than information could be debunked. And Facebook provided little to no friction to slow the spread of election fraud narratives by repeat offenders from election day through January 6th to inauguration day. Now, there are steps that can be taken by various actors, platforms themselves, lawmakers, uh, nonprofits, uh, advertisers to help safeguard you know, future elections, but I'll, I'll stop here for now and save that for the panel discussion. So I'll hand things back to you, Ken. Great. Thank you, Michael. That's uh, terrific. There's a, a lot to unpack in all of that, and we'll come back to it in a moment. Um, Mike Gephardt, you publish seven daily newspapers and lead an organization that represents in interests of Georgia newspapers that seek to inform readers with reliable local news. You've had issues with Google and Facebook for years. Uh, explain how they are harming your business and the work you do to inform the public. Uh, thank you, Ken. And let me just by way of introduction, uh, I, I want to quote uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who wrote in January 16, 1787, the basis of our government being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. And were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers 
are newspapers without government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. So I, uh, I concur uh, with Mr. Jefferson. I, and Ken, I appreciate and panelists and uh, uh, participants, I'm glad to be part of this. I'm here today as my capacity uh, as the president and CEO of a multimedia company that reaches local Georgia communi uh, communities with seven websites producing over 100 million annual page views and seven, uh, seven hyper-local newspapers. I'm also the current president of Georgia Press Association and serve on the board of a national organization representing newspapers in all 50 states, America's newspapers. I've worked in the news industry for parts of six decades, so I've had a front row seat to the changing nature of news consumption and distribution in this digital age. There are many existential challenges facing local journalism. We're facing a crisis as we try to survive. As I get into the Google action, I don't want to, to mislead everyone and say that the predicament we're in is 100% because of Google. That's certainly a big part of it, but there are other market forces at work here. My company and the entire news industry is confronted what what seems like insurmountable struggles to level the playing field because of the vast power exerted, uh, exerted by dominant digital platforms like Google and Facebook. It won't surprise you that I believe a free and diverse press is essential to a vibrant, uh, vibrant democracy. Google and Facebook have disrupted this in a massive way. You've all heard the term news desert. In our state of Georgia, we have nine counties without a local newspaper and more are surely to come. What I'd like to address first of all is a synopsis of an antitrust action being taken against the duopoly of Google and Facebook in which I'm personally involved. Why am I part of a group of media organizations suing Google and Facebook? Ladies and gentlemen, we do not have a level playing field. I'm all for legal competition, free enterprise, and legally market-driven forces, but you can't have someone making up the rules and controlling every aspect of the game for their benefit at the expense of publishers, and most importantly, the thousands of communities that we serve. All roads lead through Google. These two firms monopolized the digital ad market for revenue that would otherwise go directly to the communities being served. I'm joining others to take a stand against big tech. They're the, uh, the modern kings in a Shakespearean way. This action now involves over 200 newspapers. In this filing, we have two goals. Number one, to recover past damages to newspapers and our digital sites caused by big tech companies. The other is to establish a new system going forward in which we aren't just competitive again, but we can succeed. Google and Facebook are defendants in this complaint because of anti-competitive and monopolistic practices that have had a profound effect on our country's free and diverse press. I want to just quickly summarize a 46 page complaint with a, a couple key bullet points uh, as to what we are alleging that Google and Facebook, Facebook did to, to strangle a primary source of newspapers, uh, of revenue for newspapers and our websites across the country. They unlawfully conspired to further dominate the digital advertising market in a secret agreement codenamed Jedi Blue, so they could manipulate online auctions causing enormous financial harm in the form of revenue loss to newspapers and our associated websites including mine. This impacts every community we serve. Google monopolizes advertising markets by engaging in conduct 
that lawmakers prohibit in other electronic trading markets by controlling the ad exchange and steering buy and sell orders to its own exchange and websites. You're probably well aware in 20 years, Google has purchased well over 260 companies becoming one of the world's lord, largest corporations. So you'd think that would lead to better organic searches, but instead businesses must compete for users based on how much money they pay Google. I would submit in closing this part of my discussion, I would submit this is anti-competitive conduct. Great, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, there, uh, Mike, there are also some laws that we're gonna get to later in the program that uh, separate from the lawsuit that are aimed at leveling the play field, playing field as well and, and helping the, the news, news media. All right, Judge Doyle, tell us how you got into social media. What flat platforms do you post on and how do you use it? All right, thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, the other two panelists obviously are dealing with some very serious matters and are very interesting and I know you're gonna love to delve deeper into them. I'm your slightly more lighthearted uh, panelists. Uh, the things that I get to talk about um, are really those that I think most of us individually are concerned about whether how social media affects us or how we can utilize it to you know make life more fun or improve our careers or reach out in in any number of ways um, so how did i get involved in social media my first foray was when i was running in 2008 for an open seat on the georgia court of appeals and um, at that time i opened up what was a MySpace account. And I'm not sure if any of y'all are familiar with that and created a LinkedIn profile. And when I say I created and opened these things, what I really mean is my the 20 year old son of my cousin did these things for me and created these accounts and told me, you know, how to turn them on my computer and to post things. And I didn't do much with them then, but I did post occasionally about the race. At that time, um, I was still more comfortable just getting in my car and driving from location to location around the state and in meeting people as opposed to trying to reach out online. Then later on with some few friends in my den, there was something called Facebook that one of them had created, had, had joined. And so we looked at it, we all stared at it. We kind of, you know, looked up to see if there were people on it we knew and I created a Facebook page. And so initially I kept it private but then I was up for election again, and that's when I opened my private Facebook page up to the public and began using it for the campaign. So in off election years, which are for me on the Court of Appeals, five of every six years are off election, um, I post a few rants about my, you know, children's uh, calendars at their schools, which I don't like, and some random things about my cats our never ending renovations and trees falling in my yard, my love for tab until Coca-Cola <laughs> did away with it. Um, and for the past few years, a Christmas tree countdown that I begin on December 10th and run through December 25th. So if you know how to add, you can tell how many Christmas trees I put up in a given year and decorate them all myself. Um, but, but now because my Facebook became public, I decided to open an Instagram account. That was something else that was new out there, um, which I could keep private. I didn't want to necessarily be posting lots of pictures about my children in a public Facebook page I used for elections um, because you just never know. Uh, you know, there's always people out there lurking and I didn't want them to know too much about my private life. So I got onto Instagram. I follow a few friends there. I do not use it for campaigning and the like, and I have intended to keep it private. I think that is the case, um, uh, it, that that still is the case. And I follow celebrities, designers, authors, and like I said, some friends. So moving forward, um, I had not ever turned on Twitter, um, but in 2019, I decided there was gonna be an open seat on the Georgia Supreme Court that I was going to run for that open seat. And one of my colleagues in the state of Georgia's Twitter laureate, uh, presiding judge Stephen Dillard, convinced me that I had to join Twitter 
to be involved in this race. So by convinced me, I let him create me an account um, and teach me how to post on Twitter. It was very daunting at first. I didn't understand it, it looked different. Um, but I quickly began to use it just to post where I had been, what uh, events I was going to, and, and various things about the campaign. That came, the campaign came to kind of a strange end in that the individual who had the open seat decided um, to retire early. So I no longer had to campaign um, and use Twitter for that. So I quickly realized that I could get up-to-date news on college football, on pro sports, on the Hawks, things like that. And I began to use it for that. Also to, you know, see what was happening in appellate law Twitter, which is a thing, um, as well as Georgia political and judicial news. Um, so while I comment on college and pro sports and tweet out my Wordle and Nerdle scores in the morning and participate on Twitter town halls on Confederate, on, excuse me, on, on Constitution Day, um, I try to avoid tweeting liking or commenting about political or judicial news. Um, that's what we try to stay away from. And this is because as a member of the judiciary, um, I'm governed by the code of judicial conduct and have to avoid saying or doing things that might undermine the public's confidence in my independence and in my integrity or my impartiality, or just might create an appearance of those things. So with all this in mind, I found there are positive and negatives about the use of social media. Um, as an elected official, obviously it is a useful tool for pushing out campaign information and connecting with the public on a large scale quickly, uh, much more quickly than driving from place to place around the state, obviously. I mean, this has especially become true during the pandemic um, when in-person events simply were not allowed, were not happening. Um, and so you just could not connect with people in the same way. Um, and being engaged on social media also gives the public the opportunity and the lawyers who come before me and other judges a glimpse into who I am outside of the courtroom. Um, makes me a little bit more of a person to some of the people, especially the younger lawyers who join um, uh, the practice of law. Um, and I think makes it a little less intimidating, hopefully, for people who have to practice in, in front of our court, realizing that I too like cats and sports and um, read novels and things that maybe they do as well. So on the other hand, you have to watch everything you post and comment on um, because someone, including members of the media are always watching. And when I'm saying always, I mean always. One day I tweeted something about my cats on National Cat Day and it ended up as part of an article in the Fulton County Daily Report as have some of my comments about football, uh, Georgia and Florida, and you know the various uh, teams that I follow. None of it was bad. The reporting was funny and lighthearted, but I didn't consider that in tweeting out about my cats, I might now become known as the crazy cat judge who loves tap. So you have to watch, you know, think about what you're, what you're going to tweet and what you might become known for. Liking something seems very innocuous. So somebody you know, posted something about their children and you like it, um, but it can also be considered an improper endorsement. Uh, one of the things when I was campaigning for the Supreme Court, I did four things in a day. It was the first day of school. Uh, so I posted about you know, putting my daughter on the bus to middle school. I then went to a luncheon um, for one of the local bars um, hit something that afternoon and then went to a campaign re-election for a good friend of mine who was running for DA in one of the surrounding counties. Um, I posted that in a way that got um, looked at as if I was giving an endorsement to the candidate. So I had to revise what I wrote on there and make some explanatory statements in that regard. Um, you know, just sort of learning as I go, but you know, it, it was not a treacherous uh, thing, but those are some of the things that we're not allowed to do as judges is in publicly endorse other candidates. Um, so you always have to think about possible interpretations of your posts that maybe aren't your true meaning. 
Um, so I even find myself fact checking things about college football. If I'm going to post something about Danny Warfel in the 1996 uh, national championship game that I went to, I want to make sure that if I'm claiming he threw it to a certain player, I know the player he threw it to. Um, I still like things on Facebook, I heart them on Twitter. But I had a situation where I had a Facebook friend who was an attorney, um, but who I did not know personally. And I have thousands of Facebook friends. Um, but every time a lawyer you know, requests to be your friend, I usually say yes if they're in Georgia and potentially a voter, someone who can tell others about me. Um, and apparently in some time I had liked something that that attorney posted. The attorney ended up being an actual litigant, a party in an appeal. Um, and in, at, in, a, in a setting made a comment that she was surprised at some of my questioning and oral argument that seemed negative towards her side because I was her friend on Facebook. And so we had to think about, okay, well now what did that mean? So I, because this person was a party in the litigation, not just a lawyer, we defriended the person to make sure that that issue was, you know, sort of resolved itself, but also then had to ask the parties, did they feel I should recuse things along those lines that you didn't think about several years earlier. I had no idea who the person was or that I'd even liked something. Um, but those are things you have to think about when you're doing that. Um, so now I try to tell people with thousands of Facebook friends, if I like something about your cat or dog or your kid, that has no bearing on whether I may rule against you on any appeal that comes before me, but I still have to think about it when I'm doing it. You know, and I guess the most unfortunate thing I found about social media um, is negative feedback and negative comments that you're, un, you're, you're inevitably going to get. Um, today, right before this, I got on Twitter and I said, getting ready to be on a panel for the 31st Georgia Bar Media and Judiciary Conference to talk about social media, communicating in the disinformation age. I am kind of nervous that Wordle Nerdle scores may not be what they want to hear about. That was my tweet. So from that, I've gotten a few comments. Um, and you know, people are posting, I see my picture here, um, talking about my Christmas tree and this and this comment. Somebody told them I should lead you all in a gator cheer. Um, and then somebody wanted to know, was this advertised? They didn't see the advertisement about this conference and it was now too late to join. So those were good comments, but I have had um, uh, uh, unhappy litigants, you know, the Court of Appeals, there's 50% of the people who come up here are unhappy with the outcome, some more so than others. And one day, fortunately, one of my colleagues recognized that um, someone was posting, uh, you know, 10, 15 posts on Facebook and on Twitter that were extremely negative, extremely vitriolic, extremely angry. No idea who they were, but we were able to kind of figure out who the litigant was, where it came from. Um, so you have to always be sort of conscious when you're running these social media um, sites for yourself, um, your personal sites, that you have to keep a watch of over them. Um, these same individuals got on what I didn't realize at the time I had was a Wikipedia page and went through and changed all the information on there because anyone can just go in, I guess, and edit things. I had not created the Wikipedia page, so I didn't know it existed, but they went in and put all sorts of different strange things and information about me. Um, we caught that, we fixed it, but now I know it's out there. I do regular checks now of any type of social media presence that I have to try to make sure I stay on top of that um, and make sure that there isn't misinformation going out there and, and like I said, I always try to fact check the things that I'm putting out there um, so that I'm not creating any kind of misinformation. Wow, that's great. Right. Right. Um, Michael uh, Baldessaro, um, some of the most egregious examples of disinformation that you found related to the 2020 Georgia elections. Um, just if you could highlight a few of those and maybe um, use it as an opportunity to, you know, talk about what we mean by disinformation, what separates 
you know, misinformation from, you know, something that maybe is okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that the um, the most I think the most stunning uh, example from from Georgia was the um, uh, the Ruby Freeman incident. Um, so, you know, Ruby Freeman was a, uh, a polling official who was responsible for, you know, counting ballots, just your, your standard poll worker. She'd been doing this for a long time. Um, and there was a, uh, a photo or a video of her that was recorded where she would seem that she was taking a piece of paper and putting it in the trash. Uh, and, you know, the allegations quickly from that photo, which is just easily how things can be uh, spun up out of nothing it's, is that um, that she was tossing away ballots and this quickly and sort of some of the hyperpartisan media became she was discarding uh, 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 Trump's uh, ballots because he lost the election in Georgia uh, and so obviously this was you know uh, Ruby Freeman was 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 part of this conspiracy to, to toss away uh, ballots now a whole number of, of, of news articles had sort of uh, been written you know fabricating stories around this one particular incident which you know the uh, you know Gabe Sterling and then the the state the secretaries of state's office actually had to come out and and correct it um, because it became such a big problem that this was spun up out of nothing and now I, I believe you know she has uh, been she filed a lawsuit or the lawsuit was filed on her behalf um, against uh, several media companies to try to correct the record on this um, you know in her name specifically came up in uh, the conversation between uh, President Trump and 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 Brad Raffensperger so it would have been um, uh, you know, impossible if not for somebody taking a photo, a handful of news articles, you know, or one news article or newspaper coming and fabricating a story. This coordinated behavior that I spoke about where, you know, one article was being referenced by three or four other sites to turn it out and confer a veneer of legitimacy on it. And then it makes its way up to the, the president's, you know, office. And he's, you know, talking about Ruby Freeman and, you know, discarding and of ballots on his behalf on phone call to pressure Brad Raffensperger. So it's a, it's kind of a good, you know, real example of, you know, the effect or the impact that this kind of, you know, unethical or, um, you know, non-credible media uh, can have. And it's, it's, there's a two-way, um, you know, flow. So there were, there were cases where I think you saw, you know, something would emanate from a politician, or somebody in a political sphere, they would say something, you would have a whole bunch of media folks trying to pull bits of context or out of context information or individual data points to try to construct a, a full narrative or some sort of you know, evidence-based narrative to justify some you know, uh, claim that was being made by, by a politician. So you had media that was irresponsible manufacturing um, content to fit the narrative that, you know, a politician had put out. On the converse side, you had information that was being collected from individual data points. You know, somebody makes an allegation that, oh, there's a, you know, there's, there's a bundle of mail by the side of the road that must have fallen out of the back of a mail truck that gets compiled into a news article about, you know, tens of thousands of ballots for, you know, candidate are, you know, by the side of the road or, you know, part of a, you know, conspiracy to help you know win the elections or help you know rig the elections and then it comes out of Kaylee McEnany's mouth and this is actually a true example where you know that the office of the you know the president's press secretary comments on this news story which was fabricated out of nothing so you had this two tiered you know bottom up top down with you know users in the middle who are you know looking at these media sources seeing well if five news articles are you know corroborating this particular story it must be true and that's a that's that's a real concern um, that you know it's not just a matter of fact checking at that point. Um, it's a matter of you know we need you know fundamental reform to the way that you know the, the business of platforms um, to you know how these sites are actually making money like the revenue streams, the the amplification of this content is you know. Uh, when content goes viral, that makes the the websites of these you know non credible media sites more attractive uh, for to to advertisers who want to put ads with ad exchanges like Google, who are work as the middlemen, who then you know place ads on high traffic websites, and those high traffic websites benefit from the algorithmic upranking of this content. So you have this vicious cycle where there's an incentive to push out more information, and there's very little punishment at this point. And you know uh, we need platforms and private sector to all engage on this. And I think I got a little far away from the question that you asked in, in trying to answer this. Um, but, you know, the, I guess we'll go back to the well, movie. No, you I mean, you actually anticipated my next one, which is, you know, the process by which uh, this misinformation gets amplified. And, you know, because 
you know, oftentimes it's, you know, it could be coming from somebody's basement and it gets from the basement to the desk of the president and the process by which that happens, which I think you, you know, you explained is, is, uh, you know, it's fascinating, but it's also scary. Um, yeah. Um, I want to ask you particularly uh, about the role of influencers in the spread of in, uh, uh, disinformation uh, and what we mean, I mean by that. And, in, in, you know, I guess the, the biggest one might be Donald Trump, but, um, but there are plenty of others. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how you define influencer, I guess. But, uh, you know, you can make an argument that there are you know, certain podcasters who have a pretty outsized, you know, role. I mean, we're getting away from, you know, the, the, the 2020 elections a little bit, but, you know, if you look at the kind of influence that somebody like Joe Rogan has um, in this space, and we're not talking about Facebook anymore, but, you know, his ability to, you know, he's got tens of millions of people listening to his podcast, um, you know, and, 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 you know, he can say something, he can pull you know, a piece of content from an obscure article from a, you know, a known misinformation publisher, he can amplify that with his megaphone to tens of millions of people at once and people who you know agree with him and looking for you know bias confirming information will you know be reassured um or you know that just has that reinforcing effect i mean donald trump is obviously was was influencer number one um you know and there are certain you know folks who are more influential that you know than others um i think it's that what i would say to, to, to sort of put it in context is that it's not you know, any one person, to be honest with you, that's, that's the problem. I mean, you know, Donald Trump may be gone from the scene in 2024 or 2028. Um, what you have is sort of this ecosystem problem where, um, you know, whatever, you know, substitute whoever the influencer of the day is, um, you know, you have, uh, you know, somebody puts out, a politician puts out a statement, uh, media, you know, tries to, you know, wrap that into a narrative that fits what the politician is trying to say to, to you know, for political gain. They put that information out on, on, on Facebook or Twitter. Um, you know, it, because misinformation, I mean, MIT research has proven that misinformation generates a lot more engagement than other types of misinformation and definitely more than credible information. That, you know, gets algorithmically amplified because it's sensational or because it's, you know, uh, just for whatever, you know, bias confirming information people are looking for. Um, that, you know, site, all of a sudden, it, whether it's an influencer or somebody picks it up or retweets it or shares it, it goes even you know, further viral. It doesn't happen for every news story. People, more people go to that website um, because, you know, that website gets more clicks. It gets higher traffic. That website uh, all of a sudden is getting more advertising revenue at the expense of local media and credible media. Um, and, you know, there's more of a, of, a, of a business model to churn out more information, to churn out more misinformation. So you have an ecosystem that, you know, you really, you could pull in, in, in any number of different directions and try to, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, take some of the steam out of it. I don't know if that you could take the steam out of an ecosystem, sure. but, but there's, there's different angles where this needs to come at. So it's going to really require a whole of society approach on this. And that's, you know, it's, it's complicated and there are some things that we can do and there are things that platforms can do. There are things that private sector folks can do. And I appreciate what, what Mike is doing. And I appreciate uh, Judge Doyle actually doing her own fact checking <laughs> before she tweets something out. And I wish that there were more people doing that. And there's, there's a level of, of, uh, of you know, attention to detail that um, you know, not all our media folks share. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I want to do you care if I comment a little bit on this idea yeah. that, you know, there's lots of things and I think that, you know, um, getting the platforms to be more conscious and I know that that's where you had both of the mics are talking about but you know I, I, I think I mentioned when we were prepping for this a book I read by Lee McIntyre called post truth. And it sort of is my foray from when I was younger and the news was just a loss leader. It was on at five o'clock, 11 o'clock. And you knew that all they were going to tell you was what happened in that given day. You didn't have to think much about whether what they were saying had a bent to it, whether there was an angle. There wasn't no thought process. You just trusted what was happening. Um, but, you know, I feel like education is going to be a huge part in this because I'm generally skeptical of news I see and things I read and posts that I see because I remember what it used to be like and I know that this is a different world. And so when I'm reading things, if there's exaggerated language or it just doesn't seem to make sense, I question it. I look at who wrote this, things like that. But there are people who are younger than I have who have never experienced anything other but this world 
of news and the way we live in. And the idea that it are, even in our youngest children need to be learning how to recognize, you know, because there's always, you know, the impetus on making the, um, the Facebook and the Google and the people who put out this information, they need to police it. But at the same time, we as individuals need to take kind of responsibility for the things that we read and, and, and trust and believe and know how to do that. And there are like, you know, five steps for fact checking and things like that, that I would love to see our educational institutions be teaching uh, young people so that as they get older, they're able to discern truth from fact, you know, because I th don't know that it's gonna be able to get, that we're gonna be able to get rid of this um, and, you know, in any form or fashion. Um, there's always going to be false information. In my day, it was that the star or whatever uh, news on the newsstand. I don't know if you all remember that. And it was UFOs land in, you know, Florida and, you know, all those kinds of, they were so crazy. No one believed any of it, but it was still something that was on the newsstand. So anyway, just education is kind of like yeah. one thing. Judge Doyle, I want to stay just, with you for a minute on that, that same theme. Um, so you're enjoying your morning coffee as you go through your most uh, social media feed and suddenly a headline pops up that stops you in your tracks. Secret cabal of Georgia appellate judges dictate outcomes in thousands of cases. You click on the story and it carries sensational allegations about you and your colleagues. You realize the story was fed to you because you're in the legal profession Mm -hmm. and that the art, uh, article originated from a domain called lawyersbite.com. What do you do? I do absolutely nothing because I can't, I, you know, at this point, I'm not going to comment or give the tweet, post, whatever it is, you know, um, any more traction. Um you know, from a practical standpoint, I'm probably going to come back to the court and have a discussion here about is there some sort of um, general, uh, uh, you know, missive or story that we would need to put out for through from a PR perspective. Um, but individually, I would stay away from commenting on any of that um, and, and go through more formal channels to deal with something along those lines, especially if it was involving me allegations about myself. Sure. Sure. I, I guess the, the question I'm trying to get at, if, if influencers play a role at elevating misinformation, do uh, you know legitimate influencers have a role in knocking it down when it's demonstrably false? Yeah. And I understand your position being a judge, it may be very difficult to comment, but I don't know if you know, maybe um, Mike Gephardt, if you have some thoughts about that, would be, that be something you'd want your journalists to spend their credibility on as knocking something down that they knew was false? And Michael Bardis Baldessaro, is, is that something that can work uh, when people who have, you know, credibility and, and um, authority in a, in a community step up and say, you know what, that's crap, uh, not true? Ken, I, I would say from our perspective that step number one, if we know know it's false, we, we're not gonna we're not gonna let it up there. Now, let, let me. A lot of times, particularly uh, since 2016, um, everything was considered false that people disagreed with. Well, that, that's a problem just to label everything fake news if you don't agree with it. So, in our platform. And Ken, you're well aware of this from your days uh, in the industry with opinion pages, op-ed pages are a great way for people to express opinion. And there's a huge difference between op-ed and an editorial. So we find, you know, from a, a digital perspective, we'll do our absolute best not to post it if we know it's false. If someone has an opinion, you know, what we will post that on our, our op-ed unless it is just blatantly false. Michael, I don't know if you have more to add to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll frame it actually, my answer in sort of, I, so there's, I basically have, 
five big solutions, non-legal solutions for how we address this. And you know, and, and I will, and I want to. Something that's going to echo Judge Doyle. She she stole some of my thunder because I think she was right on with a, a couple of those points, and I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, one is that we need to absolutely increase the supply of good information. That's challenging in this environment. Um, but, you know, this is something that the you know, United Nations, uh, you know, High Commissioner on Freedom of Expression has said, you know, one of the big antidotes to misinformation is getting more information out there. Like we need more transparency, we need more accurate information, better voter education, put it all on the line. And whether that's coming from influential sources, credible media, you know, Walter Cronkite is not here anymore. Um, but wherever we can get good information out in a responsible manner, we need to do that. We need more uh, NPR. I, that's that's my my own personal opinion on that. Obviously, I'm showing a little bit of bias towards NPR, but you know, more accurate, critical, credible reporting. Um, and I, I appreciate that there are you know the private sector and there's you know the Craig Newmark Foundation in particular is sort of stepping up to pump money into local news, local media, you know, to try to, to make sure that we don't have these local media deserts because the work that Mike's doing and, and local media is critical in this. And so increasing the supply of good information is one. Two is what Judge Doyle was talking about, which is helping people discern good from bad information. And that is effectively what we call media literacy. And um, she, she couldn't have been more right about how we need to um, you know, help a new generation, a younger generation, um, you know, educate them on how to, how to basically you know, have critical thinking skills and evaluation skills to be skeptical about you know, information and its source, basically to you know, how do we help them to um, spot misinformation and stop the spread. And we're seeing some of that being rolled out in K through 12 curriculum now, you know, uh, in, in different parts of the country. It doesn't address the infodemic that we have now, which is sort of these, this infodemic amongst adults. Uh, and it won't necessarily, you know, if we had adult targeted media literacy, which, you know, something the Carter Center is working on right now, uh, to, to be honest with you, um, it won't stop everything. It won't make everybody, you know, think twice because there are people that are seeking bias confirming information. But does it help the people who are unwitting? Who are you know clicking on links and don't know that you know uh, the zero hedge is you know an un, un, unreputable source of information? Um, does it help them think critically? And so, can we help people discern good from bad? Third, even though it has limitations, we need to continue to do fact checking. Right? That that's it's a really important public good function. Um, the more that we can correct the record on really important bits of disinformation, even if it's in a lot of cases preaching to the converted, um, at the very least, it helps us identify these untrustworthy sources of information. And, and if it helps, you know, in a few cases, it's better than nothing. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, consider it the panacea, but it's, it's a good thing to do. Second is the fourth thing that we need to do is hold platforms accountable. Um, now, the solution doesn't rest entirely with them. We had misinformation when we had Bat Boy and all these other things and then in the, you know, the Inquirer at the grocery store checkout line, UFOs and things like that. Um, you know, that's not going to stop misinformation. Um, but what it's going to do is create friction. And so if they're putting warning labels to warn people about the sources of misinformation, like this is a known source with a bad track record, um, if they're, you know, providing labels on, on fact check content that slows the, the, you know, the spread around, so you know, there's not an algorithmic upranking of that content, if they're unplugging the algorithm from that kind of content or from known, you know, misinformation sources, um, that would create some friction that would slow it down. And then the fifth thing is going to what Mike was talking about in his law suit, which is we need to find a way to disrupt the supply chain of bad information. Uh, Mike was right. Google is the 800 pound gorilla or elephant. I'm not sure uh, in, you know, the advertising space, the way things work is that, you know, there are these advertising exchanges that function as the middle persons in between, you know, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, you know, advertisers, they put their advertisements that they want to, you know, put online with an advertising exchange who in turn is putting that on websites and they're looking for high traffic websites, whether that's, you know, the New York Times or, you know, Breitbart or whatever source that is getting high numbers of clicks. Um, that's where, you know, they're pushing content and some of these advertising exchanges um, you know, they, either they don't know that they're working with, you know, misinformation sources or they don't care. Uh, and Google is kind of in the in the both camp, I think. Uh, I think they don't know and they don't care. They're just such a behemoth in this. Um, if we can find ways to educate these, you know, exchanges, make them unignorant, educate advertisers, say, hey, you're putting your ads with folks who are, um, you know, supporting misinformation, um, that would do a lot. It, 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 there's there's a long way to go until we can, you know, uh, get more advertising onto, you know local media sites just because they just don't generate enough traffic on on Facebook. I mean, Mike's right about that. It's, you know, they they suffer from the narrow cast, you know, view. 
they don't get as much traffic, they don't get as much clicks, they don't get as much referrals. We have a lot of work to do there, but if we can find a way to um, disrupt the business model of misinformation repeat offenders, it's a step towards leveling the playing field. And so those solutions are all things we can do short of law enforcement, um, you know, or new, new, new laws um, that I think might make a difference. And I'm sorry that that answer was so long-winded. Hopefully that was clear though. Very, very clear. Uh, Ken, can I, can I yeah. jump in this real quick? Yeah, please do. I, I want to give a plug uh, to Michael and the Carter Center. Their, uh, their white report is, as far as I'm concerned, must reading for, for everyone. So Michael, kudos to you for that. And I, I'd like to, Ken, I want to just throw this out there and you all can shoot holes in me, whatever you want to do. But in your report, Michael, you talk about quality journalism and le legitimate journalism. And I, I wanna just throw a definition out there uh, that, that is my definition. Um, and this is what I would say is quality journalism. True quality journalism is content created using a reporter's experience, time, effort, skills, resources, and includes multiple sources with differing viewpoints and the end result betters the community and journalism as a whole. So I, I, I just want to throw that, throw that out there because Michael, in your report, and Judge, when you talk about fact checking, fact checking, that's quality journals. Now, Mike, I, I, that's, a, that's a great, great definition. Um, and actually a good uh, segue to a question I want to ask you, you know, based on some of the information and data that is contained in these lawsuits, which is pretty alarming for newspapers. Um, and I'll just, uh, start, you know, quickly, in the last 14 years, there are 40,000 fewer journalists working at American newspapers. In the last 18 years, 2,100 local newspapers have closed. Uh, Michael, Mike, what, what happens when communities lose their local newspaper altogether? Um, Ken, I, I think because newspapers are such a critical part of democracy, when a newspaper's doors are closed permanently, a watchdog goes away, a voice for the community goes away, uh, keeping an eye, uh, from a watchdog perspective again, keeping an eye on what's going on with the, the government, um, all of those things, a voice for the people goes away. And it is sad when I talk about the news desert and the, the nine and growing communities in Georgia that don't have those feet on the street. Um, it it uh, is just very, very unfortunate. Again, I, I said this in my opening remarks about Google. I don't fault Google entirely for that. There are market forces, but Google and Facebook are a huge part of it. And Ken, I'll address when, when you want me to, I'll address, uh, and you might want to get this to this here shortly in solutions, but the, yeah. the bills that we're working on exactly with what you're talking about. Yeah, no, I, I do. And I was going to get to go to Judge Doyle next um, uh, for some questions about, about social media. You know, Judge, one of the things that was interesting to me, at least when we were, you know, putting this panel together is that uh, the Georgia Bar has been well, is still in the process of developing guidelines for legal professionals on how to use social media, which seems um, surprising given that it's it has been around uh, for a, a little bit. And um, and I mean, I thought that the uh, you know the the guidelines that you laid out at the top were you know pretty pretty good and you might consider um, sharing them with, with the bar. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, um, as they develop, uh, develop some, some for everybody else. Um, you know, so I had a question about how you uh, sort of restrain yourself uh, when you read things. And I thought about this because um, we just had an example in Georgia where a judge from Athens um, was so irate over what he saw in a social media post that he brought um, the poster into his chambers and um, behaved unprofessionally. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, but uh, how do you, you know, 
how do you uh, you know stay above the fray and um, put the uh, put the phone down or put the you know don't drink and and be on social media at the same time. <laughs> What's your right? Thing? That's always a good one. Is if you've yeah. had a couple of glasses of wine, is to put your phone down because <laughs> nothing good ever happens after two or three glasses of wine when it comes to typing on a yeah. uh, on your phone. And you know, I, I had to learn that as a practicing lawyer way back where clients, when when emails were first sort of starting, and then we got. Um, the messaging where you could get it even faster than an email would come through and clients were sort of all day or night would be emailing and sending. And, you know, I have been, let's say it's a Friday night, I'm out to dinner, not expecting an email from a client. And then, um, you know, having this desire to want to be immediately responsive, you know, I had to sort of take a deep breath and remind myself there used to be a day when I would get a letter in the mail. And I would read the letter at my desk and I would think about the answer and I would do some research. I would dictate a response on a dictaphone and hand it to my administrative assistant who would type that letter up and I would read it. And this was probably two or three days later. And this was perfectly acceptable in the business world for many, 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 many years. And so I try to just remind myself that, no, I'm not going to wait three days to respond to anybody anymore. We don't have that luxury in this world. But immediate does not necessarily mean in that second. And, you know, if I have had a glass of wine, is this really the response I want to type out um, quickly um, without having thought about it? So it is just, but it's a constant reminder because there's a lot of pressure on people. I think that's tough. And the same thing when, you know, you see a tweet or something that you're like, oh, you know, I should respond to this and this will be funny. And then, you know, when you sit back and think about it and you're like, oh, you know what? That's not gonna be funny at all. And that's really gonna upset, you know, a bunch of people if you, if you, if you push that button. Um, it just takes a lot of discipline. And, and you know, and, sure. and sometimes you have to make a mistake to realize how bad it can be, um, you know, and, and then it's kind of a reminder. But it is just, you know, taking a deep breath and just reminding yourself to like, if, you, if, if something gives you pause or makes your heart race as you're typing it, then maybe there's a reason. Your body is telling you something about that comment you're getting ready to make. Um, and maybe you should rethink it put it in your saved file and go back and look at it a little later. Anyhow, that's D different question. So should members of the legal profession be disciplined by say the George bar, George, uh, the state bar, if they use social media inappropriately, if they are constant purveyors of misinformation, Lynn Wood, um, you know, and misusing the platform that, um, you know, that they have access to? You know, I, I don't think I can comment about what some, whether lawyers should be disciplined or not, other than to say, we have the rules of professional conduct that you are governed by, and that covers all types of things beyond just what you do in the courtroom. Um, and so comments that you might make on TV or on social media and things, if they are running afoul of those professional conduct rules, then I would say that that would be something that the Georgia Bar should look into and address as they see appropriate based on their investigations. Um, that certainly those are things that can, you can you could run afoul of those professional conduct sure. rules by things you say and do in social media, just as you can in any other in any other location. Yeah, very good. A uh, question uh, from the chat uh, for you. Um, can you run for uh, 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 a job on the court and not be on social media? Or do you think you really need to be on social media in order to be viable? I, I, you know, with all campaigns, um, it's about getting your message and your name out to the public. And if you can do that, you have enough resources to do that outside of social media, then possibly if you can inundate the TV or the radio, but that is unlikely in judicial campaigns because the funding, fundraising is just too difficult. And so I think in this day or age, especially with 
trying to reach the younger voters who their phones are where they watch TV and all of these things. You're not going to get them if you're not um, getting them on a social media platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. Uh, Mike Gephardt, then why don't you take a moment to talk about the, the legislation that's um, that's currently uh, pending in Congress. Sure, glad to. Yeah. And, uh, Judge Doyle, as you were talking about the wine, I, I was in play, playing in my head, if you all had heard the song Darius Rucker did years ago, drinking and dialing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just not a good idea. So uh, we have a, a couple bills that I'm working on from an advocacy perspective. And in fact, uh, I'll be in Washington in two weeks uh, to, to meet with various members of Congress on both of these. But the first is called the JCPA, the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. There was a Senate hearing uh, February 2nd of this year that was just held on, on this. And there are seven Senate co-sponsors and 44 co-sponsors in the South, I'm sorry, in the House. Uh, so we're continuing to, to ask our legislators to support this bill. Very simply, JPA, JCPA is to ensure that news publishers are fairly compensated by big tech for the value of their content. Quality journalism, which we have just talked about, is key to sustaining civic society. And we have to ensure that people who create journalistic content are compensated for their work. Uh, big tech controls data and information people receive. Michael, your report clearly uh, demonstrates that. One of the largest problems facing journalism is that control of access to trustworthy news online has become concentrated on just two platforms, Facebook and Google. Quality journalism fuels big tech profits, but big tech won't pay up. So we're looking for a fair exchange for the significant value that news publishers content provides to Google and Facebook so that publishers can continue uh, to invest in journalism to help local communities. So that's JCPA. The, the key uh, sponsor of this is uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota. Uh, and her father, incidentally, was a, a newspaper person. And so she has a passion for this and it's, it's gathering a lot of momentum. The second bill I'll mention is the LJSA, Local Journalism Sustainability Act. We've already discussed, and I'm not gonna go into it any further about newspapers being in economic peril. This bill would provide tax credits for local newspapers and our associated websites. It's a five-year refundable credit providing a, a tax credit for compensation of journalists and will help local communities being served. The credit is capped at 50,000 per year and the credit is uh, year one, the credit in year one is 50%, 30% years two through five. So it's important that people understand we're not talking about a permanent handout as some pundits have claimed. It's a tax credit that sunsets in five years. So we are, are seeking for representatives, senators to support the Local Journalism Sustainability Act um, and help us with tax credits. Very good, thank you, Mike. Michael Baldessar, you, uh, you've touched on some of the recommendations that you feel are important, but why don't you expand on some of, the, some of the things you think should be done to contain the spread of disinformation. Yeah, um, well, you know, I'll talk about it starting from sort of the, the platform, you know, standpoint, just as a starting point. I think that, um, I mean, to be honest with you, despite the whistleblower leaks, uh, you know, and, and the, the disclosures, um, they've pretty much weathered the storm of what happened in 2020 with the Stop the Steal movement and haven't really done much um, to, you know, try to mitigate the next crisis. 
um, that could occur. I mean, we're all looking at 2022 and we're all definitely looking at 2024 and, you know, worried that this could happen again. I think that what we saw in 2016 was, you know, a handful of entrepreneurial Macedonian teens figured out that you could, you know, completely make up fake news stories generate a little advertising revenue and that would get you, you know, enough money to get through the month or two. And that was, you know, seems innocent by comparison these days to, you know, what we saw in 2020 when you had, um, you know, sites that are working together to compete, uh, uh, to coordinate, to uh, drown out, you know, credible media, like as Mike described it, and, uh, and are really gaming the system. They know how the algorithms work. They know how social media works. They know what gets upranking on Google. These, these guys have figured this out. Um, and, it doesn't seem like what you know. Facebook took a lot of measures in 2016 uh, or after 2016 to you know cut down on on foreign interference. And to their credit, they they you know they stomped out you know a lot of um, you know junk news sites that were coming from overseas. But they're a bit afraid to tackle what's going on right now here because it's very close to home and there's real political backlash. Uh, you know, there's you know there's a tech lash. I think is the is the the term that the geeks use. That if they take efforts that are perceived as, um, you know, cracking down on conservative media, or you know, they take efforts that are, um, you know, not perceived by you know democratic you know, lawmakers to be you know fair, um, they don't want to deal with the political consequences, and so they're you know very quickly going into you know congressional sessions and saying we apologize, we were slow to respond, you know, we need to do better, and we keep hearing that repetitively over and over again. The, the data though, that, that their own research and independent research has proven that really simple things that they can do, which literally comes down to labeling, like they know who these misinformation sites are, just putting a warning label. We're not even saying, you know, censor, nothing about censorship. I don't wanna get into first amendment issues, but not even censorship, but just a warning label to say, you know, these are sites that are known to, you know, have you know, repeatedly published misinformation, proceed with caution. That basic context, of, which provides an element of media literacy has been something that a lot of folks have called for in academia and some that NewsGuard talked about and something we call for in our report. And it would help to, you know, stop some of the unwitting spread. Second thing they could do, which they, you know, when there was misinformation, you know, problems in, in India in 2018, the last elections that was leading to violence, they restricted the number of times, you know, certain content could be shared on social media. So blunting the reach is something that they can do to create some friction, which has, you know, the, the, you know, multiplier effect of sort of reducing the ad revenue and business model, you know, disrupts the business model of these sites. You know, those are things that they can absolutely do for, for these known misinformation sources. Um, you know, the, the, the third is just unplugging the algorithm from these things. I mean, the algorithm is kind of the root of all evil in many ways. Um, you know, anything that folks know, it, it becomes like a game. If you know how to work the algorithm, you know what you have to put out there, you've, you've done your, I'm a data guy, you look at the data, you go, what got big ratings last time? What got big engagement? How do I, you know, you know turn this algorithm, you know, in my favor, like the roulette wheel? How do I game the table? Um, that's what these you know, companies are doing, these, these are companies, these, these, you know, misinformation sites are doing, unplugging the algorithm from them would disincentivize them greatly. It wouldn't completely level the playing field, but it would certainly blunt the reach and spread. And so those are things that they can do. Um, I don't know that, um, that there's, you know, a lot of appetite though, amongst platforms to do these kinds of things because it comes at the expense of growth. It comes at the expense of the business model. Facebook right now is the number one website in the world, statistically. So that just tells you how powerful they are. Now, could they exercise you know, good you know, corporate citizenship and do more? Absolutely. Do they have an obligation to under the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights? Absolutely they do. Um, do they feel compelled to do so? Do they feel shielded by Section 230? Do they feel that there is... Um, you know, the, the consequences of acting and the political backlash could be worse than the actual, you know, stepping up and doing the right thing. Absolutely. Um, does pressure need to be applied from a lot of angles to make that happen? Absolutely. And we just need to, you know, push on that to happen. That's purely from the platform side. I think I gave some answers on the what you can do to sort of disrupt the advertising and increasing media literacy. Um, but those are things that they can do right now that's in their power. Mike Gephardt, a question from the audience. Um, the noting that you and colleagues have started Capital Beat as a nonprofit news source on uh, question, should there be more cooperative, cooperative efforts uh, by news institutions to do statewide fact checking that small newsrooms can't afford to do? Um, yeah, with, with Capital Beat, because it is a nonprofit 
Um, we are, th the answer is yes. And the, because it is a nonprofit, we're seeking grants right now because we would like to hire additional people. Right now, we have one, one and a half, but Dave Williams works out of the Capitol for us. Um, Robin Rhodes is the, who is the president of Georgia Press Association, but also handles Capital B. And she is working hard in this fundraising effort because I do think more, uh, more can be done from uh, our Capital Beat offices to help smaller newspapers, including my own. I, you know, I'm I'm not the AJC, so the answer is yes, Ken. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Michael Baldessar, a question uh, from the, the audience for I think probably for you, but noting that you know Google does have does help the U.S. government in a number of ways, particularly. Um, on you know data collection for national security, and question whether that kind of re relationship makes the U.S. government um, less eager to um, you know to go after them for anti-competitive practices. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know that I have a good answer on that one. I mean, it's a it's certainly an interesting you know possibility. I, there's a lot of you know interesting tap dancing between you know Google. Microsoft, different governments all over the world, and I, I'm, I, it often works the other way around, where Google is a little bit, you know, afraid uh, of the governments in certain countries where they work. Like in China, for example, they're afraid of, you know, not complying with certain censorship um, regulations because then they would be shut out of that market. Um, you know, even Apple, for example, in you know in Russia, it was capitulating with the government to you know take certain opposition party you know apps out of their app store because they didn't want to lose access to the russian market for you know uh, apps you know app store selling or, or for profit purposes so it, it tends to work in in the other way in a lot of cases i don't know in this case if it would um if google is i don't know what secret type of you know relationships might exist i don't want to speculate on on anything but um it's a good question. I, I don't have a good answer on yeah. that. Yeah, good. Uh, just as a reminder, please do put your questions uh, in the chat. I'm trying to get to those right now. Uh, uh, Mike Gephardt, a question for you uh, about uh, JPCA. Uh, and um, questioner says, this sounds an awful lot uh, about what the news organizations have been, been involved with in uh, us, uh, with Google and Facebook in Australia last year. And are you worried about creating a similar situation in the United States? Terrific question. I I, I love addressing and as much context food. as you can give to that because I'm not totally familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with Australia, what we're again simple answer: yes, it, it concerns me because what what Google threatened in Australia is to to basically shut it off, and so I'm always afraid of what Google could do. And Michael, you were talking about algorithms. Um, allegedly, Google just about a month ago changed their algorithms and it's always to give advantage, allegedly, to whoever Google thinks needs it and benefits it the most. So I'm always leery of anything related to what Google can do because they, from a monopolistic perspective, they control it all. So in the United States, could Google shut my websites down? Well, indirectly, there's things that could be done that you wouldn't classify as shutting the website down. But Michael, as you just beautifully defined with changing those algorithms, and what happens with search and what happens with the ad exchanges, I'm always concerned about what they, they could do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Judge Roy, I'm curious if you've ever, because you've been on social media a while now, have you ever been trolled or had a really kind of ugly experience with somebody, you know, saying nasty things to you or your family or, or any, anything like that? Just the uh, a couple of occasions with the one litigant I mentioned who got on um, and was just, uh, you know, posting all kinds of things about me and that I was terrible, stupid, um, 
you know, all kind of unethical. And it just went on and on and on and on and on. Um, same thing. And then I, we blocked them on Facebook and then they moved over to Twitter and did the same thing. And it was kind of, I was sort of chasing around to try to block and then they would ended up uh, creating new names and, or having their friends come in and do stuff. So that's about the only time um, that I have ever had anything really, you know, seriously yeah. negative um, happening and unfortunately did not involve uh, my family, though one of these individuals did live not far away so we did do some reporting um you know through the court yeah. to the, re the the people who needed to know to make sure just in case it, it rose to a level beyond just yeah. uh, you know commenting on you know in the comment section yeah interesting uh, michael baldessaro um do you see a lot of potential for artificial intelligence uh to combat um disinformation? Um, it has, yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. The more complicated answer is that um, depends how it's used. And, you know, what we've seen from what platforms themselves have tried to do, um, and, you know, I'll use Facebook again as an example, and I feel like I'm picking on them, but maybe deservedly so in some ways. Um, you know, they created a um, an AI you know, tool to help detect similar news stories, similar, um, you know, basically it's a way of trying to match up the fingerprints, I think is, the, is what the term like misinformation fingerprints. If a fact checked story is caught by, you know, one fact checker, it's corrected. Are we seeing fingerprints of the same story um, line elsewhere? And, you know, can we actually apply labels and can we, you know, put information um, in a, um, you know, in more context, uh, because we see similar articles, is there a way to do this algorithmically to, to meet the problem at scale? Um, you know, that is a constant cat and mouse, though, because you're, you know, always, um, uh, you're always going to be tweaking this algorithm, and folks are always going to be trying to figure out ways to, you know, word things that beat the algorithm, it, it becomes, you know, a, a real you know, problem over time. And I think that that's, it has promise, potentially, um, and if, you know, platforms are willing to, you know, downrank that content and reduce its visibility, it can make, it make an impact. Um, you know, another thing is that, um, I know that Microsoft is currently working on, you know, uh, algorithmic approach to identifying what narratives happen to be trending and emerging. So this would be, um, you know, can we spot stuff early enough to know that something's going to become a problem online, that can we can we do viral detection of, of narratives that are that are spreading out of control and that require engagement, attention, you know, increased supply of good information very quickly, fact checking efforts, like everything directed there. Um, all of that's pretty experimental, and what we're talking about here is issues of volume and scale that you know are unprecedented. Um, so you know, it's going to require if you're talking about algorithms, it's going to require companies that have the resources and bandwidth to be able to use that to you know police uh content the way that that you know they deem appropriate in accordance to their you know platform standards um so you're basically going back to looking towards you know facebook is facebook's one of the few companies that can actually has the server power the cost to be able to afford how you run an algorithm and all this content to detect this content um they also have the access to the data that nobody else does you know google is another one that has the space in their servers to do it so you're, you're going back to looking to tech to be the savior um to you know help you deal with a problem that that they in part you know created um yeah. so it has promise yes is there limits to it yes um you know we'll see how it gets used but uh, i wouldn't get too excited and i think that um we should probably focus on you know more um less high-tech solutions in a lot of cases here and and um you know before we sort of just pin our hopes more on more technology to, to save yeah. us from technology yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, we have about five minutes left, so I think maybe what I do is is uh, just invite if you have if any concluding uh, or other thoughts that you'd like to share uh, that we didn't get to, uh, please take a moment to do so. Um, not required, but I uh, just want to give you that opportunity for a, a last word if if uh, if you'd like. Yeah, Michael. Uh, and I apologize for being so verbose on this call uh, or in this panel discussion. Uh, but 
you know, one of the things that I think is sort of a, a, a challenge that we all face, even sort of in the community of, you know, folks like the Carter Center that are trying to hold uh, social media platforms accountable and trying to, you know, gather data to substantiate the kind of harms that we face. One of the challenges that we just face in general is, you know, sort of a lack of transparency from these platforms themselves. And that comes to, you know, the, the amount of data that they're actually able to share in the wake of what happened in 2018, the Cambridge Analytica scandal that came out, I think everybody saw the Netflix, um, you know, the, the documentary on, on about the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, you know, Facebook's reaction was to, you know, shut off its access to data to, to the world. Um, and, you know, they closed with, with their API, I won't get into the technical details, but they basically turned off the spigot of access to data for researchers, for folks like us. They reopened it about, you know, a year ago to provide, you know, limited access through, you know, a tool called CrowdTangle. And they've since realized that even providing a more limited aperture of just looking at public pages and public groups, researchers and academics are still finding bad stuff. And so now they're taking steps to even further close that window because they realize that, wow, they're, they're having a difficult time doing damage control by putting information out there. There's no transparency on the algorithms that are being used. I mean, the, the, the claim, and you know, Mike is familiar with this, there's proprietary information. If we you know, were more transparent about our algorithm, we would be giving up intellectual property that you know, is essential to the company. And I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if any of that made sense. The, the, the judge didn't flinch, so I think that, that wasn't <laughs> terrible. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, a, a challenge there where, yes, they will hide behind, you know, intellectual property and, and, you know, to say that this is our fundamental to our business as a means of not sharing information that could be used to help understand, you know, how these algorithms are causing harm and, you know, helping sort of advocates advocate for reform. So we, we face in all of this, it's all this chaos, you know, a company, you know, or, or social media and platforms that are also not being transparent with us. And I, I applaud some of the work that was done in uh, 2018 and uh, Senator Klobuchar and Senator Warner were part of this initiative and it's been supported even in a bipartisan way, the Honest Ads Act, when we learned that after you know, 2016, <clears throat> when we saw that you know, Russian you know, IRA agents were pushing out misinformation in the form of advertisements that were targeting certain populations online, um, you know, our, our Senate went to work and said, you know, we need an Honest Ads Act so that we're putting more transparency because up until that point, Facebook, Google, you know, they they they, they did not, um, you know, make any of their advertisements uh, or any of the data about who's buying advertisements, who's seeing them, transparent. Now, to this day, that still has not passed. But what it did do is it forced, you know, Google and Facebook to make some data available, um, which is a, a you know a positive step um, towards, you know, we have a little bit more transparency, we have information. But it took that kind of pressure, that legal pressure. You know, the threat of, you know, amending Section 230, the threat of pressure, I think, is uh, of legal pressure is important, but it shouldn't have to come to that. We should all be sort of demanding a little bit more transparency um, to know that, you know, how these platforms are actually affecting us or how information on these platforms are affecting us. So uh, I would say that that's, you know, my word on this is we don't know what we don't know because companies don't let us know what we don't know. And I'll, I'll let the judge have the, the last say, <laughs> but, but I, I will just say this under transparency, newspaper, legitimate newspapers are transparent. And one of the ways you know that is we, we screw up. I, I, I wish I could tell you it's perfect 100% of the time, but when we screw up, there's a correction notice and you'll see this in legitimate news papers and websites all the time. So yeah, we're, we're human, but boy, we admit it and we're transparent with it. Well, and I guess I'll just close with, I think all lawyers and judges have an obligation to be honest in, in their communications and they have professional obligations. And so make sure that when you are posting and using social media, like I said, it can be very fun um, you can engage with people all over on all types of topics, but make sure that the things that you post are things that when you read them back the next week or a few months later, you still feel comfortable with that post and um, you checked your facts before you did. Thank you. Well, thank you all very, very much for uh, volunteering your time for this. Uh, I personally, I've enjoyed getting to know you all individually and uh, this has been a terrific, terrific session. So thank you very, very much uh, on behalf of Bar Media and Georgia First Amendment Foundation. 
thank you to our um, attendees for tuning in. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we'll pick back up again tomorrow. We've got uh, three more sessions, so we're just halfway through um, uh, our, uh, our conference. Um, uh, beginning at 11 a.m. tomorrow, we'll have interviews uh, with the candidates for Attorney General, uh, hosted by Richard Griffiths. Uh, 2 p.m., uh, we'll get the latest on libel law from a panel of legal experts. And we conclude at 3.30 with a discussion on covering the 2020 two elections moderated by the AJC's uh, Patricia Murphy. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again at 11 a.m. tomorrow and thank you all for joining us today.